China now has two of what appear to be the most powerful models ever made, and they're completely open. I was shocked when I read this because a few days ago, Eric Schmidt was on the Professor G show with Scott Galloway discussing a few concerns regarding the growth of AI, specifically focusing on how different nations are advancing in their AI capabilities. There were two li libraries from China that were released, open source. One is a problem solver that's very powerful, and another one is a large language model that's equal to and in some cases exceeds the one from Meta, with which they use every day. It's called Llama 3, 400 billion. I was shocked when I read this because I had assumed that our, in my conversation with the Chinese, that they were uh, two, to two to three years late. It looks to me like it's within a year now. So it'd be fair to say it's the U.S. and then China within a year's time. If you follow AI safety memes on X, you've probably seen some of the new sort of weaponized and imperious Skynet apparatus that are being released. Some pretty scary stuff that's, you know, automated, making decisions in combat, or have the potential to with the right AI model behind it. Things that are kind of scary to look at, like, for example, this robot dog that is able to quietly swim up behind you like a crocodile and start blasting away. We're also seeing sort of AI versus AI, Skynet versus Skynet. So for example, US military using AI machine guns to counter drones. And there's a number of companies like this that are doing various anti-drone tech, largely driven by neural nets, which are AI models that are kind of baked in there. But we've had the first sort of recorded killings by an autonomous machine, a drone that was not connected to a human operator in any way, shape, or form. There was no off switch, no kill switch. In the book, we, we specifically talk about this in a historical context of uh, the nuclear weapons regime, which Dr. Kissinger, as you know, invented largely. What's interesting is working with him, you realize how long it took for the full solution to occur. America used the bomb in 1945. Uh, Russia or Soviet Union demonstrated it in 1949. So that's roughly, the, it was a four-year gap, and then there was sort of a real arms race. And once that, it took roughly 15 years for an agreement to come for limitations on these things, during which time we were busy making an enormous number of weapons, which ultimately were a mistake, including, you know, these enormous bombs that were unnecessary. And so things got out of hand. In our case, I think what you're saying is very important that we start now. And here's where I would start. I would start with a treaty that says we're not going to allow anyone who's a signatory of this treaty to have automatic weapon systems. And by automatic weapons, I don't mean automated. I mean ones that make the decision on their own. So an agreement that any use of AI uh, of any kind in a conflict sense has to be owned and authorized by a human being who is authorized to make that decision. That would be a simple example. Another thing that you could do as part of that is say that you have a duty to inform when you're when you're testing one of these systems in case it gets out of hand. Now, whether these uh, treaties can be agreed to, I don't know. Remember that it was the horror of nuclear war that got people to the table, and it still took 15 years. I don't want us to go through an analogous bad incident involving an evil actor, North Korea, again, I'm just using them as bad examples, um, or e even Russia today, we, we obviously don't trust. I don't want to run that experiment and have all that harm and then say, hey, we should have foreseen this. So one of the points that Eric Schmidt is making is like, at what point do we start to sort of make some treaties or some sort of agreements about how we're going to be using these technologies in warfare? Because certainly you can imagine these things being weaponized very, very easily. Now, at the same time, our ability to create very lifelike people, people that are believable but are completely AI-generated, is getting better and better. And I'm not just talking about the visual qualities. For example, this is AI-generated by Flux 1.1, and you can see that it is absolutely indistinguishable from reality, generated by something that you can run on your home computer. At the same time, our ability to really customize how these avatars behave, how these AIs behave, how charismatic and convincing they are, is getting a lot better. More on that in just a second. But here's Eric Schmidt talking about a demo that he recently saw. I'll give you another example. Uh, you were talking earlier about the impact on social media. I saw a demonstration uh, in England, in fact. The first command was, 
build a profile of a, a woman who's 25, she has two kids, and she has the following uh, strange beliefs. And uh, the system wrote the code and created a fake persona that existed on that particular social media case. Then the next command was take that person and modify that person into every possible stereotype, every race, uh, sex, so forth and so on, age, demographic thing, with similar views and populate that. And 10,000 people popped up just like that. So if you wanted, for example, today, this is true today, if you wanted to create a community of 10,000 fake influencers to say, for example, that smoking doesn't cause cancer, which as we know is not true, you could do it. And one person with a PC can do this. Imagine when the AIs are far, far more powerful than they are today. Now, we'll come back to that in just a second because there was a really kind of mind-blowing study that got released very recently from a person we're already familiar with who created that paper, Social Simulacra. But keep one more thing in mind as you think about this. The idea of AI becoming agentic, of AI agents capable of pursuing long-term plans. Here's what Eric Schmidt is saying about that. But remember that there's a transition to agents and the agents do things. So it's a travel agent or it's, you know, whatever. And the agents speak English, that you give them English and they result, they respond in English. So you can cat concatenate them. You can literally put agent one, talks to agent two, talks to agent three, talks to agent four. Um, and there's a, a, a scheduler that makes them all work together. And so for example, you could say to these agents, design me the most beautiful uh, building in the world go ahead and file all the permits, uh, negotiate the fees of the builders and tell me how much it's going to cost and tell my accountant that I need that amount of money. That's the command. So think about that. Uh, think about the agency, the, the, the ability to put an integrated solution that today takes 100 people who are very talented and you can do it by one command. So that ex acceleration of power could also be misused. But so recently there was this paper, Generative Agent Simulations of a Thousand People by Jun Sun Park, the person behind Social Simulacra. He created a simulation of a whole town guided and controlled by about 25 little chat GPTs running around and dictating everyone's actions. In this new paper, they did something similar using a series of two hour interviews with real human participants. These generative agents were able to simulate how these people would behave in various situations, including their beliefs, decision-making processes, and more. It's assumed that an open AI model was behind this simulation. Jun Sung Park, responsible for these incredible papers, did an interview with the A16Z YouTube channel where he shared his vision of where this technology is heading. Take a listen. I think there are certainly things that we can do because there is now large language models. And that fundamentally different thing for me was this idea of simulating human behavior. And I think there's a lot that we can sort of gain from it in terms of future application spaces. Um, I think I mentioned briefly about this idea of, well, what if we can go beyond believability to create agents that are even accurate? And I think this is sort of application space in general is something that I'm also learning a lot from, from actually, in fact, this audience. My advisor and my team are big fan, fans of games but we are not from that community. And one thing that we are seeing is that there's a lot of really interesting potential, even if they look like toys, sort of a lot of really interesting technical advances, they look like toys at the beginning, right? So I think there's a lot that we can gain from there. So I think that the point Eric Schmidt is making is that we should probably have some sort of international agreement in place on what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. It's really, really important as we advance with AI.